And today I'd like to talk about segmenting trajectories, so cutting the trajectories into meaningful pieces. Um, so the first uh, application where, which motivated uh, us to work on, on segmentation wa was this problem of geese migration. So this is our two trajectories uh, from geese. Again, they have a, a tag with uh, GPS. And what the biologist wanted to learn here about is about the stopovers that the geese make. So, I mean, if you look at the track, it, it looks as if they're flying all the time. But um, everywhere where you see these markings, they actually are staying for several days, close to water, resting. Um, it's not that they really stay at one position, so it's not like a stop. Uh, but they stay in a kind of confined area. And the task here was to um, segment the trajectory into essentially flight uh, sub-trajectories and stopover sub-trajectories. So in terms of this list that I previously showed, segmentation of questions, segmentation falls, these questions fall into to the area of segmentation. So for instance, mode of transportation, um, so I'm more on the human movement, uh, analysis uh, where I want to segment into based on whether if someone was taking a bus or car or so on. Um, and this change analysis, change point analysis is also a segment segmentation question. And the two variants I'd like to talk about today is criteria-based segmentation and model-based segmentation. So criteria-based segmentation is a kind of very geometric perspective on the problem where we assume uh, that some set of criteria is given which describes certain behaviors. Um, and then based on those criteria, we're going to compute a segmentation that is as small as possible. The model-based approach, um, there we try to fit a movement model, um, a movement model which has some kind of, some, some parameter describing the movement, and then we'll try to, to maximize the likelihood of, of, of the fit. In this more abstract uh, view of what uh, algorithmic analysis tasks we have on trajectories, segmentation falls into this area of uh, analysis on a single trajectory. So for criteria-based segmentation, I want to show you three algorithms um, for a specific type of criteria, a very simple greedy strategy, um, then kind of a gen generic uh, dynamic programming approach and then a modification of that dynamic programming approach for um, which will use range queries which handles a kind of wide range uh, of criteria but still is much faster than the, the generic um, algorithm. So here's once more this motivation of geese and um, here there are two behaviors stopovers and migration flight and the goal is to find the stopovers. Uh, and here with the data, we also had an expert description of the behavior. So we had a description of what a stopover looks like. So the description here for a stopover was simply that a goose would stay long enough in a certain area and the certain, the certain area wouldn't be too large, which you can describe in, in terms of um, overall area or radius of of movement. So here we have a setting where we have a clear and for flight, okay, migration flight is simply flight where we have continuous flight over long distances so that also is fairly easy to describe in terms of uh, its geometry. So you can either say that the angular deviation is low, you can also say something about distance traveled. Um, so this is actually a simpler quite, um, behavior to describe. So from, from an algorithmic perspective now, the, the setting that we have is the input is a trajectory and it might also have not only the geometry but also additional attribute values um, like speed, heading and so on. And now we have a set of criteria and for instance we could say that within one segment, so within one part of, of our segmentation, I would like to have a bounded variance in speed or curvature or direction of flight or so on. And now 
the algorithmic goal is to partition the trajectory into subtrajectories um, in such a way that the number of paths is minimized. So we want to segment uh, into as few as possible paths while, while making sure that every part fulfills such a criteria. So you can also see it to some extent as kind of trying to maximize those segments, the length of the segments, while being able to fulfill the criteria. But from the global perspective, that means that you want to minimize the number of segments. So in terms of pictorial representation, this could be my trajectory. And now I want to cut it. And here maybe the criterion was heading, so direction of movement. So we would now want to make sure that on any of these segments, as you see, it more or less moves in the same direction. Here are just a couple of examples how this could look like. So let's assume this is a trajectory and the sampling is actually uniform over time. So if you look at this trajectory, you can read off um, also how fast the uh, object moved. So here it moved slow and here faster, here very fast and then again slow. And the possible criterion now could be to say, okay, I want to cut into parts such that within each part the speed shouldn't differ by more than a factor of two. And then you can look at this and try to count how often you might need to cut. So here the speed is more or less always the same. At some point here, this is maybe this one is twice, yeah, this one looks twice as, more than twice as long as this one. So this one cannot be in the same segment as this one. So you might want to cut somewhere here. And we certainly need to cut somewhere over here. So a valid, a valid segmentation, and here also minimal segmentation, would be to cut here, to cut here, and then, then we get three parts. If we would now want to uh, segment the same trajectory by direction of motion, and let's say uh, it should differ by at most 90 degrees, um, then again, let's have a look. So here we're moving essentially in this direction. At some point here that we start turning, so this might still be within 90 degrees, but at the latest here, this one cannot be in the same part as the part here. So we will definitely need to cut somewhere here, and then we turn around again. So we will need to cut again, and I guess over here once more, actually twice more. So then if we take a segment here, a segment here, a segment here, and one this as last segment, then that would give us a valid segmentation, and in this case, again, a minimal segmentation in terms of direction of movement. But we can also make more complicated criteria. We can also combine these criteria. So for instance, here I could now ask, uh, maybe I, on any, every segment I want to have my speed constraint, but also heading constraint, and in this case, I would get a segmentation like this. So, that's, those are uh, valid segmentations, in this case also minimal segmentations. Uh, and if you look at the criteria which I discussed so far, or in my examples, then they all have something in common, and that is that if a criterion, so if for instance uh, on this part, so this is a, this part on the trajectory, my criterion of speed, so that the speed is at most a factor of two apart. If it is valid on this part of the trajectory, then it will also be valid on any smaller part. And we call this um, decreasing monotone criterion. So any, any criterion where I can, if it's true for a long part, it's also true for a shorter part, it is decreasing monotone. And the speed criterion we looked at, and the direction criterion we looked at, both of those are decreasing monotone. And if we have a decreasing monotone criterion, oh, let me first put up, so not only speed and heading, so one more criterion, and that will be useful for the geese, is, is a disk criterion. So if you think of saying all the points should be in a disk of radius 30 kilometers, then also then if I make my trajectory, my subtrajectory shorter, this property will still be true. And also if I start combining these criteria, so if I say, the speed should be somehow bounded, and it should stay in a disk, or the other examples that we already saw, direction 
and speed should be bounded together. Also these combinations always have the property that if it's true on a long one, it will be true on a shorter one. So conjunctions and disjunctions of these decreasing monotone criteria are again decreasing monotone. Now, if we have this type of criterion, then algorithmically it's actually very, uh, they are very easy to handle. Uh, and we can actually do what I already did by these examples where I always started at the beginning. Because if it's decreasing monotone, then a simple greedy strategy works. So that means um, what I can do, I can simply start at the beginning, test whether the, the criterion is valid. Um, if so, I will continue. And then maybe at some point it breaks. But now since it's decreasing monotone, I know that if, if it's not valid on this part, it can also not be valid on any longer part. So there's no reason to check anything beyond it. So and that at this point I could cut and restart. And if we think of the, the, the criterion that, that I showed like speed or heading, then every time I add a point, I can in constant time check whether the criterion is still valid, and then this will give me a linear time algorithm um, by simply at every point in constant time checking, is the criterion still valid or not, and if not, I'll start a new segment. So why is a greedy, stra why is a gra is a greedy strategy correct? Um, so we have a very simple, very, can in a very simple uh, way check the greedy choice property here. So let's assume, um, let's assume in a valid, in, 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 in the optimal segmentation I pick this one, but the test here would actually also still have been valid, so I could have added this point to this first part. Then I can obviously still add it to the first part and then the segmentation beyond that will still be valid because if I make something shorter, it remains valid. So in that way, um, there's no reason to stop early and the greedy strategy indeed works. Now there are some criterion where this, uh, where this simply going step by step is too slow, namely those where I cannot in constant time check whether the criterion is still valid. So if you think of, of the um, staying within a certain radius criterion, what we're essentially checking is we're doing minimum enclosing uh, ball, the, solving the minimum enclosing ball problem. So there it, it's not that easy to uh, um, solve that problem dynamically. So that means if I add another point, I would have to, I might need to recompute my whole ball. So then it is um, better to use this double and search strategy, which we already saw for the simplification. So if you remember the Agarwal et al algorithm, the greedy uh, um, algorithm for simplification, uh, the strategy there was to first check uh, using exponentially increasing steps and then doing a binary search. Yeah, so here we would test, start testing with something short, then we would double the length, we'd again double the length, maybe here it is now not, the, the criterion no longer holds, but now I know here, here it was true, here it was not, so the longest possible stretch will be somewhere in between, and then I just do a binary search in between. So to summarize this part on, on decreasing monotone criterion, so we, we, we look at, here we looked at Boolean or linear combinations of decreasing monotone criterion, and if an incremental strategy of testing the criterion works, then very often we get linear time algorithms, and if not, um, we get algorithms, typically algorithms that run in order n, log n time, assuming that um, we still can check whether a criterion is valid in, in, in linear time. So, so much about um, decreasing monotone criteria, but let's go back to, to this uh, geese, uh, goose example. So, we have these uh, two behaviors, stop over and migration flight, and let me just also show you a little bit more about the, the data set. Um, so this is about spring migration, so we, and we have four to five positions per day, um, up to 10 stopovers. And if we really look at the, um, at the criterion that we have, okay, flight, as I said, can be described simply as fairly straight movement. 
but a stopover so we should stay within a radius of 30 kilometers that's a decreasing yes Yes. Uh, we have to find the, uh, the access for monotony. Ah, okay. Um, so let me go to my schematic drawing here. Oh, where was it? Far oh, back here. Yeah, all of these are fixed. fixed no, no. This is n so monotone. Monotone is just in relation to the trajectory. So there's no direction in terms of monotonicity. So it's not monotone in the geometric sense. But this is simply defined as. Uh, if I have a trajectory and it, there's not, so it, let me simply draw one. So maybe my, my criterion, my question is, does it stay within a disk? So, and what I'm now saying, this is, um, this is a monotone criterion in the sense that if I have some part of the trajectory, And this is now not monotone x or y or anything. If I have a part of the trajectory where this is true, where this property holds, so it holds on this part here, then it's monotone in the sense that if I take a smaller part, let's say this part, the criterion is still true. No, no, there's no, so what I'm saying, the monotonicity is not in terms of the geometry, it's not in relation to an axis, but simply in the sense that, um, so this is just about the subset relation. Um, it's monotone in the sense that if it's true for a large part, then it's true for every subset. So there's no geometry in this, in this monotonicity concept. I like this. So this, so there's no, this is not, with an axis, but I'm just saying if it's true for this big part, it's true for the smaller part. Any other questions? Okay. So let's get back to these geese. Uh, so flight is just heading in uh, directed here we just say it should be fairly directed. So that is a decreasing monotone criterion. The stopover, if we look at this, uh, we should, it should stay within a radius of 30 kilometers. So that is exactly this criterion here. So that is decreasing monotone. And it should do so for 84 hours. Because a, a goose to, to get enough rest, it, will, it, it uh, needs to stay in this area for a longer time. I mean, you can think of this as, as typically it's kind of a nice area of lakes, and will, it will um, stay there for a longer amount of time until it feels, feels uh, refreshed and then move on. And staying within an area for 48 hours, that is certainly not decreasing monotone. Because it's not the fact that if I'm staying there for 48 hours and now I making my trajectory shorter, that this is still fulfilled. But before I move on, let me also just show you um, some results on, 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 on what's to come now in terms of the algorithms. So um, in terms of an empirical study, what we looked at was, or oh, not we, this is um, actually worked by, by Michael Buchin and others. They looked at uh, what the biologists did in terms of um, segmenting the trajectories and in what the algorithms did and I mean you see quite a bit of similar uh, segmentation, not always um, also here sometimes these segments are simply a bit shorter but more or less um, it gives a similar segmentation but now back to, to this issue of not being monotone so we have uh, a stopover should uh, stay within a radius of 30 hours, but it should do so for two days. And this is now decreasing monotone, decreasing monotone, but this is actually the opposite. Because this has a property that if it's true for a short trajectory, so in this case a trajectory of at least two days, 
It will be also true for any longer trajectory. Uh, so two of these criteria are decreasing monotone, but one is what I would call increasing monotone. And the type of criteria we want to deal with now is combinations of increasing and de decreasing monotone. And in, for these criteria, we can no longer use a greedy strategy. Um, I have a small example here. Um, if you simply say, okay, every segment should have at least two of my data points. No, no three, if it's duration two, three data points. But uh, the speed range should be at most four. Then a greedy strategy would include everything up to here. Um, and then be not able to compute a valid segmentation of the rest because everything should have duration at least two. But instead, I can get a valid segmentation by stopping early here and then taking the rest over there. So here, a greedy strategy no longer works. So now I first want to show you kind of genera the, the generic approach of segmentation uh, and then in improve it for the specific case of decreasing and increasing monotone criteria. And this is uh, in a paper by Aronoff et al. It's called St Start-Stop Diagrams. Um, and so that approach simply handles general criteria and examples for criteria that are not decreasing monotone is, as we saw, minimum amount of time on that trajectory. For Then if I have a bound on standard deviation or some kind of average also, I will not uh, get a decreasing monotone criteria. Also, if I want to allow some kind of percentage of outliers, all of this is not decreasing monotone. Um, and so instead, we will compute these start-stop diagrams and use those to then compute the segmentation. And the idea is very simple. So I've given my trajectory. I have a trajectory and I have the timestamps. And now for any for any possible segment, so if I'm only, and I assume I'm only segmenting at vertices, for any possible segment I can check whether it's valid. So here for instance I'm saying uh, the segment from zero to, from the, from the essentially first point to then the second, third, or fifth, that is, um, is a valid segment and that's why I color the cell white. Um, also to the sixth would be valid, to the seventh no longer would be valid and that's why I'm coloring this gray. Uh, and likewise, I'm, there's no valid segment starting at the next data point. That's why all of this column is gray. So we get this white space, which is free space, you could say, we, we call it, and the black space or gray space, which is forbidden space. Um, and now a segmentation, so a segmentation sh should start at the beginning, beginning. It should go to um, to, a, to a vertex where, where, where the segment is valid, so it should go to a, to a free space cell. And then at that free space cell, I start a new segment. That means I have to I go look at the corresponding column. And from there, again, go to something that is uh, reachable or in free space from there. So I would go maybe here and so on. That means a valid segmentation is such a staircase path uh, where all of the steps are in free space. And now an optimal segmentation is such a staircase with a minimum number of um, steps. Uh, with a minimum number of links. So I want to do this with as few steps as possible. So in, um, in this example, this now would now correspond to if this is maybe my trajectory, then I cut at 6, and then I cut at 9 again, 11 and 12, so then these would be my, this would be my segmentation. Now this staircase we can compute by a very simple dynamic uh, program, so let me just quickly show it. So essentially I just, for every possible, so I compute up to any, any vertex what is the um, segmentation with the smallest number of pieces. So for that I'm going to maintain uh, the number of links that I saw so far. I'm also going to maintain uh, what was my previous step so that I can at the very end not only know how long my 
the minimum segmentation is, but from this second information I can also reconstruct what the segmentation is. And then I just fill it up from left to right. So I initially I need zero steps. Um, if I want to go to vertex number one, that is not possible at all. So then there's an infinite number of steps you could say. And so on. Here is the first interesting case. This one I can reach by um, starting at zero. So then I have, I'm using one step. Um, this one I can also start, uh, reach directly from zero, so I also get one step. Here now, if I want to get here, I will have to use one of these. Um, and the ones where there's a non-infinity value are, um, is this one here. So here I con was able to get with one step. So one step more gives me two, and so on. And then at the very end, I know there's a valid segmentation using four segments and this first, uh, this first, um, this last um, allows me to see what the actual segmentation is. So I can follow it back to here and then here and three and zero. Yes. Yeah, so, so, what, so what you first do is you compute this diagram. And uh, in this diagram, for, for illustration, the gray parts are parts where the segmentation is not valid. So I cannot go from zero to immediately um, uh, the last point because this would not be a valid segmentation because this one is gray. So I can only, if I want to make a step, I can only do it within at a white at white area. If you have a criteria that all the pixels are white. Then it's one step, yes. Yeah, only one section. One section. Yeah, then it's only only one segment, yes. But, but in this algorithm we have at least I think we have at least at least two sections, yeah. Uh, no. Have choose, we have to choose only the orthogonal the right the movement. So if the if this top right one is white then this one, it will, so I mean this is, uh, the, so the dynamic program simply um, for a given, for a given uh, row here checks all of the white cells, looks up which number you find, um, and then takes that plus one. So if, if this one would be wi white, I would see here, okay, the smallest number uh, which I can use to get here is actually the zero, so I will take that, and then this would be a one. In the previous slide, uh, we have only. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Good. Okay. And this is, of course. So I do this. This is a linear number of um, um, values to compute, and for each value, in, in in the worst case, I'm looking at the whole row. So this is a quadratic time algorithm. And now we would like to, so quadratic time um, for the big data is a bit slow. So now we want to do better. And we will do so by looking at a specific type or class of criteria. And I will argue that this class is actually quite a, a very relevant and big class, so which allows us to solve most of the problems we're interested in. And, and that is what I call stable. And stable means that if I look at the number of changes um, on some kind of on a, on a candidate segment ending at i, which means if you look at a row of this diagram, then the number of changes should be small in the sense that if I look at all, do this row by row, um, then overall there's only a linear number of changes. Yeah, so here in this diagram, uh, if to count this value, there's one change here, one change here, one here, one here, zero changes here. So this this sum would be one, two, three, four. And um, so that's in O of n in this case, you could say. And this, that type of criteria we call stable. So you could say on average it should have a constant number of changes. And if you look at specifically decreasing and increasing monotone criteria, 
they fulfill this property. So this is a, a decreasing monotone criterion. So if meaning if this is white, everything below is white. Uh, but then the forbidden space has this ortho convex shape or um, the staircase shape, let's say. Uh, that means I will only have a, overall a linear number of changes and the same for increasing monotone. Increasing monotone that is that as soon as I have something white that remains white, then again this uh, uh, non-free space uh, has a staircase, staircase shape like this and it is a stable criterion. And for stable criteria, you can encode these diagrams more efficiently, so we can use a run length encoding. So now I'm going to store this row uh, not, not as, as, a, as a row as such, but I'm storing the number of um, non-free cells or this, and then the number of free cells and so on. So here I only have free cells. So this gives me, for a stable criterion, uh, a representation of this diagram of linear size. Now, if we want to use this efficiently, the first step that we need to be able to do efficiently is to compute this diagram efficiently. Um, and this we would like to do in the following way. So I want to essentially know where these steps are. So this is now for a decreasing monotone criterion, not general stable, but decreasing monotone criterion. What I can simply do is I, I, will, I have two pointers. So let's say I start at the end. I see how far back I can go while still being valid. So let me do that. This is still valid. This is still valid. This is no longer valid. And as soon as I see that it's no longer valid, I know because it's decreasing monotone, I don't have to check anything here. I also know that um, in the next row, I can go at least as far. So now I can simply move this pointer. No, it should move. Good. Um, and continue from, from here. So now I will move this pointer again and still, oops, until it's no longer valid. And in this way, find all of the staircase. What we need to have if we want to do, run this algorithm, we need to be able to move this pointer, which means we need to be able to extend the segment. We need to be uh, able to move this, uh, this pointer, so we need to be able to shorten a segment. Uh, and then we need to be able to check whether a segment is valid. So the, what we now is some, uh, what we need is some kind of data structure with, which allows the following three operations: testing is valid, allowing to extend, and allowing to shorten. Um, and typically, the data structure used here will be a balanced binary search tree. Um, in particular, if you have, the, for instance, these, for uh, uh, a criterion like a bounded range. So if I am asking about, um, let's say, speed in a certain, the speed should be in a certain range, then yeah, that information I can simply, I can speed, uh, store the speed values in a, in a balanced binary search tree and then the extend and shorten is simply insertion deletion and is valid, I can also check easily. Yeah, so I need those three operations, but those are typically also easy enough to get. And then the running time is n times the time these um, operations take. So this will typically be n log n. And we can do the same. The same approach also works for um, increasing monotone criteria. So we know that this means that we can compute the start-stop diagrams for increasing and decreasing monotone criteria efficiently. And now if we have any combinations of those, then we first compute the the, the, the basic ones for the increasing or decreasing monotone criteria and then start combining them. So for instance, if this is, so this is an increasing monotone criteria, if I want to compute it, uh, combine it with a decreasing monotone criteria, then that is, is a fairly simple operation that, to do, which I can still do in, then can do in linear time. Uh, also, if I need to negate a criterion that I can also do in linear time, then I just have to uh, change those, essentially those colors, you could say, what's free and what's forbidden. Um, so all of these operations now simply take linear time. So let's see what we can handle by now. So let me give you a few examples, which we were not all of them we were able to handle previously. So we can give lower and upper bounds on attributes. So that is actually still that was an example for a decreasing monotone one. 
angular range criterion was also decreasing monotone, this criterion also decreasing monotone, but we now can also do something like allow an approximate fraction of outliers. So if you think of this, it is not directly obvious that it's uh, decreasing or increasing monotone, but um, since, it's, uh, since I allow, allow myself some kind of approximation, I can phrase it in terms of if the trajectory has a certain length, um, which I as such is an um, increasing monotone criterion, if it has a certain length, then the number of outliers should be below a certain value, which is a decreasing monotone criterion. And then I can combine several of these, so in this case I actually, if I want to do an approximation, I will combine a logarithmic number of these, and can express in this way a fraction of outliers at least in, in terms of uh, a true approximation or whatever approximation factor we then would like to have. So this is what, how we previously computed um, a segmentation. So with this table here, and now the question is how can we do faster? Um, and the idea is to use range searching um, and to augment binary search trees. So let me just briefly, ha so there's just one slide about augmenting binary search trees, which you all know. So we first choose an underlying data structure, maybe it's a uh, red-black tree. Then we determine the additional information that we want to maintain, which is in the, our case the minimum number of steps needed in, in the subtree uh, for the, for the um, end, uh, start points that are uh, in the subtree. Then we verify that this um, uh, can be maintained, but such a minimum count, I only have to look at the uh, node itself and its children, so that is easy to do. And then we, okay, then we have to put, use this in our algorithm. And what we essentially do uh, use this for is range searching. So let me show this by one example. So assume we now want to again compute, we essentially do the same dynamic program as before. So we compute how far we get um, for um, row by row. Now assume we are in this row here and want to compute how far we can get. So, so now here I see this five. So it means that I have a block of five free cells. If I have the row indices, a binary search tree on the row indices, and I've augmented this tree with the number of uh, minimum number of links needed for, for any subtree, then I can uh, simply for the you do a range search on, on this block to find the minimum number of links needed for any of these uh, rows and in this way compute this value in log n time. So this will overall then give me for this part of the algorithm a, a running time of order n log n. Okay, so to sum up the criteria by segmentation I showed you a greedy algorithm, uh, the, I showed you the example of goose, goose migration um, the start-stop diagrams as such give you quadratic time, but uh, for a large set of criteria, and the, I would argue many criteria uh, fall under this condition, we can actually uh, have algorithms that run in order n log n time. So now I have a second part based on model-based segmentation. I'm not sure how early did I start? When did I start? No, I don't, I mean, um, it was I five apps or nine apps? I have 20 minutes, yes, good. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you. So I would like to show you this model-based segmentation in particular. Um, okay, it will be again be a dynamic program, so that I will do somewhat fast because uh, we've seen enough dynamic programming today, at least for my lecture. If you have dynamic programming, I, everyone will be happy to see it. <laughs> um, uh, but I want to show you how we classify segments because that's also geometrically an interesting um, problem. So now the setting, here's, an, uh, here's a data set where, where we looked at this for. So this is a fisher. It's a small mammal. Um, we would like to segment the, the trajectory of this fisher, but uh, we don't have any given criteria. So we don't know or we don't 
make any assumptions about what behavior we are looking for, which in, is a very common setting if somebody has a data set like this and wants to understand what is the behavior, then it's, it's uh, maybe not the, very often it, uh, I, we cannot simply ask back here, yeah, but what behavior, how do you, would you characterize that behavior, but they want to know themselves how that behavior looks like. Um, so, so in such a setting you cannot use criteria-based segmentation if you don't know what the criteria should be. Uh, and that is a setting where we now want to still do uh, a meaningful segmentation. So we call that when we, so this was a, the model that we essentially always use if we talk about trajectories, so we have the data points um, and we just assume linear motion in between. Now uh, think of a setting where we have uh, fewer data points, yeah, so all of these data points are missing. Okay. We can still do straight line segments between the data points that we have, but the fewer data we record, the more unrealistic this uh, assumption of linear motion will be. So then, uh, at least biologists like to fit statistical or stochastic uh, models to the data. One that is actually used quite frequently is this model of Brownian motion or Brownian bridges. So here you see a Brownian motion. Um, and a Brownian bridge is essentially a Brownian motion conditioned under, um, under the knowledge that uh, one data point was here and one data point was here and so on. So a bridge, a bridge essentially uh, fills the gap in between two data points. So the assumption here is that also the data points, uh, assuming that I have some GPS error, the, I don't ac exactly know where the object is. So I have a normal uh, a Gaussian distribution here, a Gaussian distribution here, and then while interpolating uh, over time, I'm assuming I have a Brownian motion, and then the, 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 the movement that I get in between at any point in time, again, will be a Gaussian uh, distribution with a variance which increases while, which increases if you're further away from any data point. Say that again. The limit cycle? Yeah, this trajectory is around this point. Uh, is that the li so, uh, limit cycle is something like which uh, in the, the asymptotic of the dynamical system, there are some sort of the behaviors which, which somehow generically appear and uh, everything is somehow uh, tends to that situation. So, I was mm -hmm. wondering if you, you're looking at these kind of, uh, I mean, this kind of positions in, in terms of a uh, uh, of a system or um, okay, so I don't know asymptotical dynamical systems that well, so I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the setting here is actually very simple. I, I mean, I know where I was here. I know where I was. No, I know that I was more or less here. I know that I was more or less here. So then uh, I will s the my, the if if this in between in terms of in between. So let me do time axis here. So I know at this time where I was, I know at this time where I was. Now I look at any time in between, I'm interested in the distribution of where I might have been. So that is then, um, and I uh, essentially the question, where would a Brownian motion be conditioned under the fact that I know that here I was here and there I was there. Uh, so it's a very simple model. And I think you will know better whether that, how that fits into, in, in, into the larger scope of your, your question. Good. Um, and this now allows us also to, to look at, at, at uh, problems like this. So let's assume this is my very sparse trajectory. I want to know, I know, want to know whether this area was visited. So in gray, you may or may not see. In gray, this is supposedly the actual trajectory maybe. So it actually moved through A. The polygonal path that I get d did not move through A. Um, but if I assume such a model, then I would at least say, okay, with a certain probability, um, 
I moved to A or I, the expected time I spent in A um, is something also. So this allows me to, to, to make inferences about the trajectory if, if I don't, um, if the data is sparse. And this um, model of Brownian motion has one parameter, the diffusion coefficient. So I'm fitting a model with one parameter and depending on how I set the parameter I get, di get different movements. So this is just one instance uh, for if, if the diffusion coefficient is very low, so it's fairly, no, it's not, I'm fairly straight, it's mathematically certainly uh, wrong, but it, it, it stays fairly close uh, to, to the straight path. Uh, if I increase the diffusion coefficient I will get more diffusion and eventually I get this, a lot of uh, variation in the path. So now the idea is to say I want to fit such a Brownian bridge motion model to my data um, using a certain parameter and then for certain, for different sub-trajectories I might want to fit a different parameter because maybe certain parts are very straight then I want to fit, use a low parameter on certain parts maybe the, 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 the trajectory moves a lot in uh, uh, around while not making large distance, then I want to fit a larger diffusion coefficient. So the, pro so the question is segmenting such that I can fit a diffusion coefficient well. So what I want to do is, um, I want to, for each subtrajectory, um, if I look at any subtrajectory, I have a likelihood function which tells me uh, for a given parameter, and I would like to maximize this likelihood for every segment. Now the problem is, um, if, I, if I just say, okay, I want to maximize the likelihood, then my trajectory will be cut in many small pieces, because the smaller the pieces, the easier it is to fit the parameter, or the better I can fit the parameter. So there are tra the, here now we have a trade-off between how well the fit is, and how many um, segments I get. And that is a, a, a setting where often a, an information criterion is used. So what I what I will do is for my segmentation I'm going to um, look at the how well the fit is, so I'm going to look at the likelihood or actually the log likelihood, um, but I will also have to avoid overfitting I will also have a parameter, a penalty factor for the number of segments. And depending on how, how large this penalty factor is I might get fewer segments or more segments. So this part is to avoid overfitting and it kind of nicely gives us a setting that we don't get, hopefully get a small number of segments. And now an optimal segmentation is a segmentation that minimizes this term. And okay, we've, as I said, we already seen a few dynamic uh, programming algorithms. This again is, is, a, is a simple dynamic do programming algorithm where I either Either it's essentially the n squared algorithm that we already saw, uh, where I have an additional term which um, relates to computing, um, uh, to, to fitting, fitting, uh, computing the optimal parameter for for a certain subtrajectory, or if I already know, if I already know which um, diffusion I have a, a, a kind of a discrete set of diffusion coefficients um, as candidate sets, so I, I know I want to fit to a subset of these diffusion coefficients, then I can essentially have a dynamic programming table where I have a um, row for each candidate and then I get an order n times m algorithm. But instead of going into detail about this algorithm, I'd like to move on to the uh, classification or, or um, clustering problem. So here's just, but let me show, show an uh, uh, example of a result for this. So what I have here what I'm showing here is uh, the number of segments versus the penalty factor. So the penalty factor, the, uh, for the penalty factor, uh, the larger the penalty factor, the more costly it is to use many segments. Um, so if I have a large penalty, I would use very few segments. So at the end, I will only use one segment. On the other hand, if I have a very low penalty factor, I will have many, many segments. And we, uh, in, in kind of an interactive setting, we use this to, to look at if I plot penalty factor versus um, 
number of segments, then we are essentially looking for, you could say in this diagram, we are looking for a stable part, you could say, so uh, kind of a penalty factor which holds for a wide, uh, no, a uh, number of segments which holds for a large range of penalty factors and then shows that as a, as a segmentation that we used. And this one is then shown here on the right. But the question that we now still, that I now still want to address is the following. If I have a segmentation like this, how can I cluster or classify the segments into a small number of classes? So now we have the segments, but every segment will have its own diffusion coefficient. But if I assume that this comes from a process um, where there are essentially a small number of behaviors, and if I assume that to, with each of these behaviors I can associate a certain diffusion coefficient, then I'm actually looking for a small number of diffusion coefficients which I can use on, um, or, such that I can use for each of these uh, segments one of these diffusion coefficients. So you can imagine in terms of uh, behaviors, you might have a behavior where somebody is resting, um, so then actually you have or resting or, uh, or just moving as very confined area. So then you have a lot of data points which are on one spot and um, uh, just kind of moving around there. Then you, you might have uh, settings where, where somebody actually wants to travel somewhere like, like uh, here on the screen. So then there you expect a very low diffusion coefficient. Maybe if, if an animal is foraging, it stays in an area but really moves around a lot in that area then you would expect a high diffusion coefficient and so on. But you'd like to use one diffusion coefficient for foraging, one diffusion coefficient for kind of directed travel and so on. So now this problem actually looks very similar um, to, to, to the previous one um, with a small couple of small changes. Now we want to um, not maximize the likelihood of a segmentation but a max likelihood of the classification. Or let me say this classification in terms of uh, so, classification is a terminology that biologists like to use here. Um, in, in terms of data analysis tasks, this is more clustering. Um, so, we want to maximize the likelihood of a classification. Um, again, using log likelihoods and a penalty factor, but now this is not the number of segments, but the number of different classes that we are using. And then an optimal classification is a classification that minimizes the number of, uh, the minimizes this criteria, uh, this uh, information criteria. And the results here are um, if we have only a discrete number of parameter values, values that we allow to use, so essentially if we say instead of having a continuous range of uh, values, we're going to, to sample the space, so then I get this discrete number of values that I might want to fit to. Then we get a polynomial time algorithm. Um, the general problem is NP-hard, um, but I'm not going to show you the proof here today. Um, but if we, under reasonable assumptions, under how the log likelihoods like, look like, we can actually get, a, again, a polynomial time algorithm. And this is what I'd like to focus on in the last five minutes. So this is a setting. Um, now it's, uh, it's actually by now very ungeometric, you could say, but it will get geometric again. Because now my input, I mean, I don't really need the trajectories. I need the likelihood functions. My input is a set of likelihood functions. Uh, and the output should be a petition of these trajectories according to the likelihood functions. Um, and for each group um, a parameter value x, such that this information criterion is minimized. Uh, it's maybe the first important observation is that um, it is not the fact that um, if I just look at the maximum values of these likelihoods, that uh, an optimal classification uh, respect the order of maxima. So this is an example where uh, the first likelihood function has its maximum here, 
the second one here, the third one there, the fourth one here. But if I want to use two values, then it's best to place one value here, the other one there. But then actually L2 will be classified together with L4 and L3 together with L1. So there's no monotonicity that we can use immediately. Um, but there is a slightly different property that uh, still rescues the situation for that, us. And that is if I have a set of values, so I have this x1 and that x2, um, and I have a likelihood function with one maximum, then it will be, so the, the class this L2 falls into will be either the one, the just, the one uh, just smaller or the one just larger. So for each of these likelihoods, I, uh, my, I essentially need to, if I know the parameters, I have to decide between two of them. So if I have a discrete set of candidate values, then again I get a simple dynamic programming approach where I um, compute the optimal classification for the first, using the first i values. So let me do that by example. If I only use this parameter, allow this parameter, then I, since L1 has a maximum to the left of it, and this is the first one, certainly L1 would fall into the class of X1. Um, and for these we don't uh, know yet. If I allow, if I have X1 and X2, then L1 will certainly fall into here. L2 and L3 have their maximum between X1 and X2. So at this point, if I know I want to include X2, um, I can decide for 2 and 3 whether they should go here or here, and they will go there. If I also allow X3, then I see that, um, that it's actually, so then I will look at the two optima here, add x3 as op optional additional value, so here either I will take x1 and x3 or I take x1, x2 and x3. For both I test um, um, where to place all of them, so in particular if x2 is missing then L2 and L3 have to decide between x1 and x3 um, and that is actually because of in this case the information criterion the better, the better fit, so the optimal classification using x3 is actually using x1, only x1 and x3 and mapping a, uh, the fir 1 and 3 here and 2 there. And I can continue like that and get an algorithm that runs in if I have k likelihood functions in k m squared time. So one more observation here is that if we add if we add um, um, uh, parameter, possible parameters uh, values one by one, uh, then actually the, 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 the in terms of how much these, these functions shift, that is bounded. Um, and we're going to use that in the following, um, um, this is again, you could see it as a dynamic program, although we will formulate it slightly different approach uh, for the problem if we do not have a discrete set of parameter values. So and the idea here is, are we looking at a diagram? So where, so now my dynamic program will be on the number of, I will extend the number of classes always one by one. Um, and in that way, I'll be looking at uh, settings where um, are we looking uh, at a setting where, uh, let me just, do I have it on, no, the index number I don't have on the previous slide, um, where given that I know where, where, um, where with uh, f fewer classes I, I place the, the parameter, I might now kind of, the, the corresponding trajectories might shift to, to other parameter values, but I can express this in terms of um, where, in terms of, um, in terms of what am I saying? Ah, right, here. So here it is. So what I want to, so I have, I have a classification with i parameter values. I now want to compute the classification with i plus one parameter values. 
I know that if I look at the j's value, so in sorted order, the j's parameter and the j plus first parameter, it has to live in the space of the j minus, so the, the j's parameter needs to be between the j minus one's parameter from the previous classification and the j's parameter of the new one. Yeah, so if I add, if I allow myself one more parameter values, they kind of might shift a little bit and the new j's one will be in between here and the j plus first one will be in between these two values and I can geometrically look at, at this like this. Um, and then if I not only look at the at the um, not only want to find the j's and the j plus first one, but the j minus one and j's one, then I again get some kind of staircase as we had in the start stop diagram. And the important, uh, let me use this more or less to wrap up, the important uh, observation here is that if I look at the following, you could say isoline, which is the, uh, which uh, describes that if, so I have this likelihood function of this likelihood function L1 and I'm looking, I now assume that it has this nice, that it just has one maximum. And this is then, um, I look at the two values where the likelihood function is the same. And so this P has the same fun value as Q and I plot this value in this space and I do this for every possible height here, then I get this curve. And what this curve describes is, if I now think about where to, um, if I now in the space say, okay, my, this point where, uh, which describes in the I plus first uh, classification, the J's and the J plus first value, if I, if I know that this point is here, then I know that um, it no what does it mean? It means that the j's one is, is so it means that in terms of um, of of L1, the trajectory that corresponds to L1, I can read off from whether it's below or above whether it should in terms of the classification go to the class j or the class j plus one. Yeah, so if I'm exactly on that curve, meaning if this point is exactly on that curve, it means that these two values are values where the likelihood is the same. So if I'm exactly on that curve, I, it doesn't matter which class I use, but I can use this class to determine whether to go to class j or to go to class j plus one. And now I, what I can do is I add more likelihood functions and I look at now the space, so arrangement of lines that I get by adding all of these, you could say, isolines. And the nice property now here is that as soon as I pick a, a, a pair of values which corresponds to a point in this diagram, I exactly know which, um, which uh, likelihood f uh, for, for which trajectories I'm going to, it falls into the class uh, xj and for which it falls into the class xj plus one. So if I fix this point, so within one region, within one region the classification is the same, so I can maximize per region and then uh, I use some kind of dynamic programming to extend this approach to more and more classes and this is essentially uh, a longest pass calculation or you can see it as a dynamic program and let me just also show this slide so this is where we now apply this to the Fisher data and now you see if we the classification that was computed we have these long sec so the red segments are more or less uh, long pieces of movement and the blue ones always include a significant part where the Fisher is simply moving on one spot. So the classification, this classification, I would, this is actually the first one where we do use the discrete classification because we don't have to work with the arrangement, but it's a simpler dynamic program, gives us actually a nice um, classification. And with this, I'd like to wrap up. Let me just put up one open problem. And that is, um, so stable criteria, which 
is a last class, uh, large class of criteria, so we can handle increasing and decreasing. Uh, we have efficient algorithms, but in general we, we don't. And there's still some kind of some kind of class in between where, where it would be nice to have efficient algorithms uh, because they, it's an important class, but we can I don't know how to handle them. And that are essentially um, settings where you have a la average or standard deviation uh, because these are non-monotone. I mean, if you if you think of an average, um, I might be I have a, might have a segment. The the average is let's say the average is let's take a criterion where I say the average should be above some value so maybe for this part the average is above this value then it might drop below that value so uh, but then if it goes up again then I might again get something where it's above that value so, so averages are non-monotone similarly standard deviation is non-monotone but it is a criterion that is often used so it would be nice to get faster algorithms for this problem and that's it, thank you <laughs> so, so the um, outlier here is always relative to the criterion. So, if I, for instance, have this criterion where I say um, speed difference, difference um, is bounded by delta, let's say, that is, that is my criterion, then I'm just saying that uh, outlier just means that I'm allowed for, for a subtrajectory, so maybe I have this nice subtrajectory but some kind of weird outlier here. Um, so all of this has similar speed uh, and then I could, as a criterion, instead of just taking this, if I want to be robust uh, to outliers, I would say speed difference is bounded by delta except for and then I can say maybe a number of outliers or the example that I gave was where I say okay except for 10% of the points. So that's what I mean here by outlier. So it's not necessary geometry. Ah, mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I introduced uh, the, these models uh, by by I mean, the, these models are used for very often used for sparse data, and that is how I introduce them. Um, uh, but for the for the segmentation or classification problem as such, we don't um, we don't throw away data points, so we don't do simplification. But for the model fitting. I think for the Brownian bridge m motion uh, model, the, the standard model fitting um, is that you this leave one out approach, where you essentially say, so you have your your data points, um, and then you you look at you now estimate the parameter by saying, okay, let's assume I n these I simply assume are given and I want to compute a parameter such that uh, the, mac the likelihood is maximized um, that this one would be here, here, and here. But uh, yeah, so that is this, this is more about um, yeah, computing the parameter. And also you can use a different approach to that, but that is what we use. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an interesting question, uh, but but in this context, it's not a question that we. So I mean, we weren't simplifying here. Um, I have some work on 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 um, simplification under under um, you'd say could say uncertainty assumptions. 
but that's then, um, yeah, not so related to segmentation. Okay. If you want to have any other question, you can continue in the break time. This break time after 30 minutes, we come back for our next lecture. Thank you. Thank you.